The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So in this section, um, we're going to take a look at some of the stuff you can do with ZFS. So we'll look at uh, creating um, a schedule for snapshots and replicating those to another system. We'll talk a bit about ZFS scrubs. Uh, we'll also um, figure out what command line utilities would be useful for people to know about, and I'll make sure they get added to the course. And then in the next um, uh, section, the last one, we'll, we'll get into the plugin jails and how can we install software using ZFS. So if we take a look at the system that we have going here, if I remember correctly, I think we just have one volume and we didn't actually commit to making any data sets. So right now, all we have is a volume and it's not showing any uh, data sets or zvols underneath it. So I'm going to go in and create a data set. Since we're just doing it for demonstration purposes, I won't give it a quota or any reserve space, so we'll just add it. Okay. So you'll notice um, you can tell that a volume has data sets if it shows underneath it. So we just sort of make little subtrees. One of the things you can do, ZFS does support nested data sets. So you can create data sets within data sets if that's part of your strategy. I often get confused. Um, I don't know if I'm making a data set within a data set or a data set on the volume. So if I get confused, I just close all my data sets and the one that's left over is for the volume. And I can go in and create as many data sets as I want. So for the fun of it, let's make a, a second data set. We'll just call it data set two. And once that's created, they should both show under volume one. So we have data set one, data set two. The other things that we see in storage uh, deal with our periodic snapshot tasks and replication tasks. So we talked a little bit before on what a snapshot is. So it's basically what that portion of the ZFS pool looked like at that point of time. When you're taking snapshots, you can either do the entire volume or you can do um, data sets. So it's up to you when you're scheduling um, your snapshots, what you'd like to take a picture of. As a reminder, and for those people that weren't here earlier, um, when we um, went through the ZFS definitions, a snapshot itself is a read-only copy. And the snapshots, typically you take them very often because they don't use up any space until data changes. So a lot of administrators, for example, will take snapshots every five minutes, which means they can actually restore data up to a five minute point in time. And since the space is very little used, unless you're changing a lot of data, it's not taking up more space on your storage pool. So it doesn't hurt to take a lot of snapshots. It really depends upon how often do users have to recover files or to get older versions of files. That will pretty well decide how often you like to take a snapshot. Depending upon your data set structure, what you're actually storing on your data sets, you may decide only some data sets uh, contain files that people tend to need to get older versions of and decide just to take snapshots of that. So it's really up to you. Snapshots are really cool and they're a really a uh, useful way um, to be able to restore data, but they are not a substitute for a full backup. The data, um, the snapshot needs for the original ZFS volume to exist. So if there's a catastrophic disaster and you lose your ZFS pool, your snapshots are no good to you. The snapshots are only useful if the, if the original pool still exists. 
So you still need a, a complete backup strategy. But this is something that you can use to supplement your backups, um, especially if you just need to access a small amount of files and you want to, don't want to dig out your off-site backups. So they're, they're an elegant way of augmenting your backup strategy. When you, um, and the other thing I'll mention, because it is read-only, um, what you can do is create something called a clone, and that's a read-write copy. And the clone itself takes up no space until it starts making changes to the clone. So one strategy that you can do is you can take an existing snapshot, clone it, set it up as a share, and let people go at that portion of the file system so they can go in and make changes to it. Um, if you ever destroy that clone, um, those um, um, changes are lost, but it is one way of getting that old data. So we have something called um, periodic snapshot tasks. So we now have a volume and two data sets. And when you're creating a snapshot task, what you're really doing, come on wireless, keep going for me. <laughs> let's, let's hope we can still get in there. Hopefully it'll load up for us. What you're really doing is you're scheduling the automatic creation of snapshots. You're saying how often you want snapshots to be created and whether you want it to be created on a full volume or on a particular data set. And you can do it on a data set per data set basis. Yeah, I wonder if we've lost our connection. It's not looking good. If I still have. I still have an IP. Well, the course may get more intellectual than visual. <laughs> Does anybody else still have theirs up, or have we um, completely lost? You're 51? 61. I'm just wondering if it's me. It says my connection is still up. Let's see if I can ping anybody. Um, yeah, you said 51? No, 61. 61, thank you. Yeah, it may just be my system that's uh, being picky. Oh, thank you. No, I can ping you. OK, well, let's see if she opens. That would do it. Okay. We'll look, crawl over there. Well, if it gets that bad, I think we do have a snapshot or a picture of this. We can at least see what it looks like. Now, what page are we on? Not quite as exciting as seeing it real. Are you going in there? Ah, there we go. Maybe. Let's we'll see if she opens up. It's trying. Well, let's see what we can do here. See how big we can get this. Not very big. Ah, there we are. Okay. Well, let's see what you have in your storage. I'll uh, just take a look at your volumes. So we do have that. I'm just going to quick make a quick data set again. Okay. And one more time. So if we add a periodic snapshot task, yes. So if you've created volumes and data sets, 
every task you create, you have to say what it is that you want to take a snapshot of. So you can make as many tasks as you want. You can set different schedules for different data sets. And um, again, it's going to depend upon what sort of data you're storing on a data set and how often you'd want to be able to recover that. If it's you want the same policy for the whole thing, just go for your whole volume. Um, I'll go for the volume, so um, test 821. You can decide how long snapshots exist, and by default they last for two weeks. So you can set a period longer or shorter than that, and you can go up to years and it will take any integer value here. No. So you're going to have to remember every 20 years or so to go in and <laughs> When they say begin and end, you're really saying, I don't want you to take snapshots before this hour of the day, and I don't want you to take snapshots after this hour of the day. So you could have it go from midnight to midnight if you wanted it to, and it would always take snapshots. So it really depends upon when your users are actively changing files. So if it's 9 to 5, you can set it for 9 to 5. You can also set the interval. And this, I think, they've changed. People were complaining there weren't enough intervals out there. So it looks like you can go from anywhere from 15 minutes to one week. So within that time period, if I don't start or end between these times, I can say take a snapshot every 15 minutes, or take one every hour, or take one once a day. You can specify which days of the week. So again, if your users don't come in on the weekend, you don't have to take a snapshot. If they do, you can specify the days. So let's just go in. We'll pick the uh, shortest interval. We won't keep it that long, so we'll keep it for two hours. I assume it's between 9 and 6 for your time zone. We'll take one every 15 minutes. Once you create a snapshot task, it will appear under the tree, so you can go in and change its settings. The other thing you can do is you can view all of your snapshot tasks. So if you've created a whole bunch, you can see what they are, and it gives you a summary of what's happening with each task. So it'll tell you your um, volume or data set and the settings for it. You'll find that as soon as you create a snapshot task, it will go in and make your snapshot, and then it will follow your schedule. Because I've selected a volume and that volume contains one data set, it creates a snapshot for each. If I don't want to get all the data sets on a volume, I should instead do it on a data set per data set basis. And this will automatically happen every 15 minutes. This will be really boring uh, if we don't have any data that changes. Um, but on an active system where data is changing, you'll notice that your use space will change, and it will tell you, give you basically an idea of um, how many megabytes or whatever of data is changing within that interval, because it'll show the original and uh, for each snapshot afterwards. Does anybody have any questions on snapshot tasks? Why you'd want to create one, or or what's happening with their scheduling? Yes. Yes. So they're stored in a hidden directory. So on the volume, there will be a directory called .zfs. And if you take a look at that, it'll um, show you the snapshot. So I think we can do that. I don't know if you're going to be able to see, because um, Web Shell doesn't display that well. Um, so ls mount volume 1. Dot .zfs, and it seems to me they had it hidden directly. Uh, it's because I can't spell, that's why. Yes, so it's always related to the data. Okay. Yeah, and it's still not showing it to me. Sorry? Yes, so they really are dependent upon the pool, which is why they're useless if your pool dies. Um, 
if I know if I SSH in, I can see them in .zfs, and they're always going to um, have a name that's basically related to a timestamp, so you have an idea of what the date was. And if I'm doing 15-minute intervals, I can, I can check my 15-minute times. Uh, they'll show up in the snapshots. Yes? In the case of uh, dates or snapshots, is there a way to plug in, say, a second USB thumb drive and just have it all going in that? Yeah, so we're going to do replication tasks next. So what we recommend is that the snapshots actually get stored on a separate system. So, so that way they're safe. Um, We've had a lot of people ask, how can I do this um, just to a USB drive? And right now you can't do that from the GUI, but you could write a script that uses the ZFS commands to create a snapshot. So there is a ZFS snapshot command. Um, and then you could cron that and have it go to your USB drive. But you'd be dropping down to the command line to, to make your script. And you'd want to test it well before croning it. So the, the GUI was designed, let's send it to another system. Once you have snapshots, you can do those replication tasks. And replication tasks basically take your latest CFS snapshot and uses rsync over SSH to send it to another system. Obviously, that other system has to be formatted with ZFS and it needs to be running rsync and SSH. If that other system is another FreeNAS box, um, you're just going to have to start the rsync and the SSH service on it. And other than that, it's ready to go. So when you add a replication task, you can't do this until you have some snapshots. So I'm just going to get this out of the way. If there isn't anything showing under your ZFS snapshots, this drop-down menu will be empty. It's saying, I don't see a volume or data set that has existing snapshots. There's nothing for me to replicate. So it won't let you make the replication task. So if you go in here and there's nothing in your drop-down menu, that's your problem. You're going to have to check out your, um, you either forgot to make your snapshot task or there was a problem making the snapshot. You're going to have to tell it um, the name of the file system on the other system. Um, so if it's called backups or whatever you called it. And this thing here, this initialize remote side for once, um, the only time you do that is if your replication gets stuck. So occasionally there will be a problem replicating over a snapshot and replication just sort of stalls because it's saying, I was expecting this snapshot name and I got this instead. And the best way to fix that is to check that button. Now, if you do that, it's going to um, delete all the snapshots on the other side. So you only do that if replication gets stuck. Um, but that will be a quick way to kickstart replication. By default, it's going to come in on the default SSH. And um, if you want to change the port, you can, as long as your SSH um, server is listening on another port. And you're going to have to put in the host key for the remote system. And you can find out uh, on a FreeNAS system, if I go into replication, I can view the public key. So if I'm doing that on another FreeNAS system, I can just cut and paste that public key into my replication task. If it's not a FreeNAS system, um, you can use, what, what's the command, SSH. There's a command that will let you um, view your key, and it escapes me at the moment, but there is an SSH command you can use to view your key. Is it on anybody's tip of their tongue? or No, that creates it. There is one that uh, is, is just not coming to me, but there is an SSH command to do that. Can you have to go to another ZFS pool in the same system? Yeah, so really the periodic snapshot task, um, 
If you have your console on when you're doing it and you watch it, you'll see what the ZFS command is, and it's basically piping your ZFS snapshot, ZFS send, it's piping it to SSH. So that's what's built into the GUI. If you want to send it someplace else, you would rewrite that in a cron job and you would pipe it to someplace else rather than piping it to SSH. So you're basically playing with ZFS send, ZFS receive. Those are the two commands that get used. Yep. Yes. And the one thing that people find out um, the hard way, with ZFS, you don't want to get low on pool space. So you want also always want to make sure you feed it enough disk space. Some people will, will go, oh my god, I'm running out of space, and they'll start deleting data. And they don't get the space back because they have a snapshot task created. So as soon as they delete it, that gets written to the snapshot, so there's still a version of it. So it doesn't like ever get deleted. So if you really get to the point where you're running out of space, delete your snapshot tasks first and then start deleting data if you need to recover disk space. Yeah. So we had a user do that recently and say, like, I've gotten rid of eight gigs of disk space and I'm getting none of it back. What's happening? And that's what the culprit was. Uh, any other questions before we leave replication? Okay. Um, the last thing that we can do in storage, which we touched on a bit when we talked a little bit about ZFS, is something called ZFS scrubs. Uh, the scrub only occurs on the volume. So basically it occurs on your storage pool. And we mentioned in the definition that a ZFS scrub is very similar to like doing a mem test on memory. It's going through all of your um, physical sectors to see if there's any problems with your disks. And it will try to auto-correct things that it can correct, and stuff that it can't correct, it will send you an alert about. So ZFS scrub is a good thing, because it gives you an early indication of disks that are probably going to do a disk failure at some point. So it's a good way to find out between that and your smart tests. A ZFS scrub is going to be very I.O. intensive because it's basically going through all the blocks on all of your disks. So it's not something that you're going to schedule for when users are actively using the FreeNAS system. Whenever you create a ZFS volume, so your pool, it automatically creates a test for you. And this is something that changed. Let's see if we're still up. Something that changed between 8.04 and 8.2. Good. So the default, we added something called threshold days. And you'll notice that that number is divisible by 7. Usually the goal is let's do our tests on Sunday when we're going to have not that many users on the system. So we'll have all that disk I.O. intensive stuff happening then. What happened before we put in threshold days, um, this is basically a cron job that you're doing, and you would find that if you set like a 20, um, a 30-day schedule, it would be on a different day each month, and it would start to impact users. So we put in the threshold days. We recommend whatever your threshold days is, make sure it's div divisible by seven. If you read um, the ZFS um, recommendations, um, so we had links to that in the PDF, it recommends that if you have data center quality drives that you do a scrub once a month, and it recommends if you have consumer quality drives that you do a scrub once a week. So if, you're, if you just have generic drives, um, you'll want to change that to something like seven, uh, just so that it can go through um, your drives. Once you've picked your thresholds, um, you then can decide at what time that occurs. 
So the default time is at 2.15 in the morning. On um, once a month, once every month, and it looks like, no, it shouldn't be every, that looks like a bug, that should just be Sunday, because we're aiming for Sunday. I'll have to ask about that. Oh, okay. I was going to say, that doesn't look like the default to me, but <laughs> I haven't played that deeply with this, um, this snapshot. So typically, you'll pick a day when you're going to have the least disk usage. Make sure it always occurs on that day, and pick a time of the day or night that's going to be the, the least intrusive. How long it takes is really going to depend upon the size of those drives. Um, so you may want to start really early in the morning if you have a very large um, you know, a lot of drives in your storage system. Uh, any questions on the scrubs? Now, one thing I'll mention, there is a delete button. We recommend that you don't delete the scrub because it really is an early indication of uh, impending disk failure. If you find, what we were finding is that about once a month, some users were saying, my system locks up. And those users typically um, had um, not very good disk I.O. subsystems, and they often had a very low amount of memory, which ZFS doesn't like anyways, low memory. And they were saying, my system just locks up about once a month. It works great, and then it locks up. And the culprit tended to be your ZFS scrub was running, and it was too much for the system to handle. That's typically only going to happen on really low-end um, systems. Um, if you find that the system you're running on tends to become unresponsive during the scrub, what we recommend is that you disable it temporarily until you can either get more memory in there or a better disk subsystem, because um, you really do want to know if something's happening with your disk. Uh, we do give you a delete button, but uh, we usually ask that you disable it instead of delete it. If you either by mistake or whatever do delete it, uh, you can just go in and add a scrub. So, and it will give you the same menu. And yeah, there's a default, just Sunday. Okay. I feel better now. I thought they introduced a bug. Um, so that's basically our ZFS management. Um, so we already talked about how to make the data sets in that. Uh, you can make your snapshots, replicate them to another system, and do your ZFS scrubs. Any questions before we leave ZFS management? Okay. Um, when you do get a chance to go through the PDF, uh, page 41, actually shows you how to copy the keys in that. Uh, so when you're setting up your replication task, so they go through. The other thing that we have, we've already talked about web shell, and we've used it a couple of times. Do we, do we have, know where the lights are here, or is that managed someplace else? I'm just wondering if we can see web shell better if we dim the lights for a minute, if it's going to show up any better. Because right now, you can't really see anything. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And, that, and that's still not better. OK. So you know, we might as well turn the lights on. You can't see anything. <laughs> so if you do get a chance to play with the ISO, I, I recommend open up web shell if you're a command line person. Uh, just to see what you can do. There are a couple of limitations in web shell. So FreeNAS itself is FreeBSD, but it is a stripped down embedded version of FreeBSD. So they've stripped out a lot of stuff, one, to make sure it fits on the thumb drive, and two, um, just to make sure that it's um, suited for storage. So they've taken out a lot of stuff that doesn't belong in a storage appliance. One of the things that there wasn't room for on the image was man pages. And typically, if you're at the command line, um, the first thing you do before you run a command is you read the man page. So man is not going to work in web shell. Having said that, all of FreeBSD's um, man pages are online. 
So because you're already in your web browser anyways, you can just go to the, the, man, the online MAM pages and read what you need to read. And the URL for those MAM pages is on page 44. So you can just go in and search for any MAM page. So that's typically what I do, because I really do miss MAM pages. Um, by default, you're thrown into the Bash shell, because that's the shell that most people are comfortable with. You can change to other shells. I know extended CSH is there. I don't think um, the Z shell is there, but I know the extended one is. Uh, you do get history. You get um, command line completions. You can type tab, and it will fill out the rest of the command to your file for you. And you can use your up and down arrows to scroll through your history. So it is convenient that way. Basically, most of the commands that are available on a FreeBSD system are available there. And often, this will be helpful to do things like to run, um, say, um, ZF, um, ZPool commands to check the status of things, that sort of stuff. Now, I did have a couple of commands that I thought would be useful. And then I sort of ran out of imagination and didn't know what people would want to do in a shell. So we may add to that. And let's, again, even the PDF doesn't show up that big, but we'll see what luck we have. So it's page 45. And let's see if we can get a decent uh, view on this. That's 200%. OK, that's a little bit better. At least we can see the, the print. So often a useful command is to do a zpool status. And this will show you all of the disks that have been fed to the pool. And usually what you're interested in is their state. And you do want to see things like online. You don't want to see things like degraded, because um, that uh, typically means there's a problem with that disk. The one thing I didn't show you, and we can probably take a look at that. I'm going to go back to our volumes. We didn't take a look at view disks. So whenever you create a volume, it's going to show you the information about the disks. Uh, let's see what we got here. Might not be so exciting in a, yeah. Yeah. Did you, do you know how many, um, did you just have the one disk or do you have a bunch of disks? I've got a bunch, but they're not connected to this version. Ah, that's why. Okay. I was going to say it's not very exciting right now. <laughs> Typically, if you fed a bunch of disks, it'll show all of your disks, and you can then match it up to what shows in ZPool. So it'll show um, the FreeBSD name uh, for it. So if you actually need to see what disk it is. So in this particular one, there aren't any, um, any problems. It's also not very exciting. There wasn't any data on those disks. I just took a screenshot. Another command that you can do is you can do a ZFS list, but don't take what it gives you to the bank, because until we have ZFSD, you're not going to get really good data on, on your disk usage. But it will give you sort of an idea of what your use space is and what your available disk space is. But it's not going to be completely accurate. Um, you can go and look at your messages at any time, doing a tail of our log messages. And if you want to watch it live, you do a tail hyphen F. And that's where my imagination ran out. So is there anything else you guys would like to know what would be the command to do whatever. I know you guys have much imagination as I did when I was trying to think what commands to do. What do you usually do uh, with ZFS, Chris? Do you do anything other than those two? Yeah. So I'm going to add that one where you find out the version, where it basically showed you the table and it stopped at 15. So I'll add that. I'm just trying to think what else would be useful. 
Maybe you know how to do it in Linux, but you're not sure if it's the same in FreeBSD. If anything comes to anybody, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we add it. What's that? For whatever. So what, if you had a storage appliance and you had a shell where you could do anything, what would you do? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So we got ZFS stat or ZFS status as well. Okay. Um, I don't remember where I am. Ah. Okay. So we can do a ZFS status. Do you usually do a switch with it or? Okay. Yeah, Yeah, because uh, H is human uh, yeah. output, so we'll show your gigs, meg uh, megabytes, terabytes, whatever. Do you have switch H? So disk free, human output. Anything else? Okay, so search for AHCI. Yeah. Okay. What time is the next break? Okay, we're doing good then. We'll have lots of time to play with plugins. We'll, we'll give that a minute. Um, see if we can get back into her and we'll take a look at the disks. Um, one of the things we should probably do is we'll do a um, little intro into the design of the plugins jail. Uh, so we'll, when we come back from break we can just go in and start installing uh, plugins. Has anybody used FreeBSD jails before? So are people familiar with that concept? Okay. Yes. I know Chris is. Um, so the f when the, in the new design of FreeNAS, the operating system itself is just a tight core. So it's the stuff that's deemed to be something you have to have in a storage operating system. So the ability to create shares, volumes, permissions, that sort of stuff. A lot of people like to add additional software and it really depends upon the type of data that you're storing and what you want to do with that data. So what people tend to miss the most is things um, dealing with, um, say, movies or sound, so things like the ability to do UPnP. Um, a lot of people do a lot of funky stuff on the, thank you. A lot of people do a lot of funky stuff on their storage appliances, which some purists would think, well, that doesn't belong on a storage appliance. So you have people installing uh, development environments. You have people installing um, different types of file systems that didn't come with EOS. Um, just basically anything that you can do. So one way to basically extend the functionality without touching that core OS was to use FreeBSD jails. And a FreeBSD jail basically allows you to install another version of FreeBSD on a host operating system. As far as that new installation is concerned, it's pretty much like having another FreeBSD installation. 
Um, it's not quite the same because some things get shared from the host, but it's basically its own environment. And with jails, it's a little bit different than the other virtualization environments out there because it's very lightweight. And it was something that became very popular with ISPs. It's a different way to do hosting. So you can, for example, on one um, server, set up tens of thousands of jails, and it can actually take that. So it's not very heavyweight, say like an ES, ESXi or doing VirtualBox or something. So it's a different way to get different operating systems. And each um, jail will have its own set of users. Um, it will um, have its own root access, and you can install its own software, and it's separate from the other jails. And it's also it separated security from the, um, the, the base system hosting the jails. So the whole idea is typically you would run services in jails, and if that jail, for example, got compromised, it doesn't affect the host operating system, and it doesn't affect any other jails that are installed in the environment. So it's a perfect place for running, uh, say, internet-facing servers. So it's, it's basically its own restricted environment. So this is a perfect place to go in and install additional software that's going to be separate from your storage. It's not going to affect your stored data. It's not going to affect your host operating system. It doesn't affect your config, but you can still install stuff and enable those services. So that's the whole idea behind that. One of the things that Freenas added to their design, which um, currently is not in FreeBSD jails, it's still in the development version, is something called vImage. So one of the traditional problems with jails is they shared the network stack with the host OS, so you couldn't do things like have multiple broadcast addresses per jails. You couldn't do things like have multiple firewalls, so each jail has its own firewall. You couldn't do things like having your own IPsec set up in different jails. They had to share that, but with vImage, everything is separate. So it basically gets its own networking environment. This is really handy when you start doing things like transmission or Firefly, and you have services that rely on their own broadcast address. So this is something that's going to be built into the design. And it's something that is in your version of the ISO. So that was added after beta 3, and it will be in beta 4. Um, have I lost anybody on the whole jails thing, what it is that we can do with jails? In the FreeNAS design, what you download um, and what you have on the thumb drive is you download what's called a plugins jail, and that is something that you install. Once you install that plugins jail, you basically have a FreeBSD environment that you can install software into and you start the plugin service, and then you can install software. One of the things that is part of the design is we want to make software installation as easy as possible and to provide popular software packages that people can mix and match from. So we've decided to use the PBI format, which is something that was actually developed by Chris hiding in the corner there. So it's used by the PCBSD project. So PBI stands for Push Button Installer, and it was designed that from a graphical environment, you can easily install and uninstall software. So when we're dealing with FreeBSD software, there's a lot of software that's been ported to FreeBSD, and I'm going to show you how to install some of that um, in the next session. But the problem with the software that's been in, uh, ported to FreeBSD is it's designed to be installed from the command line. So you either use the package add command or you compile the port. What the PBI does is it takes that existing software, wraps it up in a format where you can do that from a GUI. So you don't have to install from the command line. FreeNAS has actually extended the PBI format. What they've done is not only can you install software from your web browser, 
The other thing that you can do is it will add the software that you install to the GUI. So we were talking earlier when we were looking at the services that it was divided into two panes where you start the services. Maybe, maybe we'll see it. Yeah, it's trying to get over the wireless network. That's the problem. <laughs> we'll see. While it's loading, we'll see if we can visualize. There was one side that showed your core services, and there was the other one that said plugins. So what happens is when you install a PBI into a plugins jail, it gets added to the plugins tab of the services entry. So that means you can start and stop the service and verify it. The other thing that we're going to see, um, hopefully, <laughs> when we come back, is when you go and install a plugin, once we have a plugins jail, if I install the Firefly PBI, Firefly will be added to the tree. And then all I have to do is click on Firefly, and I'm going to get one of those nice little GUI config things where I can check off all my Firefly settings, just like we did for everything else in FreeNAS. So that's the additional wrapping that has been added to the PBIs. So it integrates into the stuff that you're used to using in FreeNAS. Um, let's see here. Um, we got 10 minutes. And hopefully that's going to be better, because right now that's really slow. I've lost you all together. So what we're going to do when we come back from break is we're going to install the plugins jail. And it's uh, uh, basically you, you just um, navigate to the, the jail's PBI on the uh, USB thumb drive. It will install it for you. We'll start the service, and then we're going to uh, install Firefly, uh, Transmission, and Mini DLNA, because those are the PBIs that are currently available. And you can see what they look like from the GUI, if the GUI crop cooperates. <laughs> OK? Any questions before we go on break? Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people 
uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones it extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astros based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astros or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astros. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Astris, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. 
At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros convoy communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.